One minute, one minute. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I call the City Council Committee of the whole meeting for Wednesday, October 21st to order. I'll explain the little differences here in a moment. Uh, but um, as we continue to deal with COVID and all the issues there um, impacting so many people, uh, please a moment of silence. Alderman Ambrose will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge my allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Alderman Ambrose. And uh, right before the roll call here for Brian, it's obvious uh, we have some spread out uh, new rules here. So uh, Brian will read the roll call, but uh, just so everybody's aware, Alderman Peacock, Alderman Jobson, Alderman Dorman, Alderman Grip, Alderwoman Lee, and Alderwoman Dickman are, are called in and on and aware. Uh, so just so when you, if people are hearing that, um, I'll explain a little bit better in a second. Brian, please roll call. Dunn. Here. Dorman. Here. McGinnis? Here. Lee? Here. Grip? Here. Condon? Here. Peacock? Here. Dickman? Here. Jobjin? Here. And Ambrose? Here. 10 present, Your Honor. Thank you, Brian. So uh, everyone's noticing that uh, I assume we have a little more spread out atmosphere here. Uh, we went back to a few months ago when COVID was going strong. Now it's going strong again, unfortunately. Um, we put in some more practices and procedures to help uh, maybe curve, take the curve down and uh, be safe here for our staff and, and people that come to talk with us. So I thank uh, the older women and aldermen that are calling in. I, I appreciate your patience. I will try and be patient. Uh, I'll ask everyone. Uh, to pause as they ask for A's and nays or responses. I'm, I'm going to try and do my best. I'm looking at the chats. I'm looking at the call-ins. I'm looking at the, the buttons. So I'll try and take my time, and um, I'm going to ask everybody to be patient with us as we, again, go back to these procedures. As we know, uh, there, last Thursday, both the health department, our hospital folks, and myself, and the other mayors from the Quad Cities, um, talk to you about how the cases are rising again and how the concern for the hospital capacity is, is, a, is a big deal now. So um, we thought it was prudent, um, and it's good to see Ms. Mc, our, our wonderful friend, Alderwoman McGinnis, back with us. But as, as still it is going on in our community and, and things are rising, I thought it was prudent, and so did others, uh, that we draw attention and we make sure our city facilities and our meetings are safe. So. Uh, again, I thank my colleagues for calling in, and, and I ask for patience as, as we go back to uh, a little more different scenario, kind of what we did before, so thank you. Um, again, as we begin the meeting of the City Council, I'd like to welcome everybody in attendance. We, we do have a few public, a couple, um, who are, and people who are viewing on the computer or mobile device. We respectfully welcome your comments and opinions. And as I did before, if you from the public would like to submit your comments to the mayor.info uh, email, if you are kind enough to put your name and address and information on there uh, by 2 o'clock of the day of the meeting, um, our wonderful 
Miss Tiffany and Miss Samantha will collect those for me and I'll, I'll be happy to read them into the record, uh, but I need to have your information uh, so we know who's submitting those things and I have one tonight, okay? Um, happy you're participating. Uh, ask that everybody's participation reflect the common desire we all share to make Davenport an even greater place for all of us. If you have a cell phone with you, make sure it's on silent um, or off. If you're on the phone, uh, please make sure any uh, noises are off or you're on mute. And uh, if you wanted any public wants to address the council on any specific item on the agenda, you're encouraged to do so during that standing agenda. Um, you'll have five minutes. Please come to the podium if you're here. If you sent me an email, I'll read it at the appropriate time during that agenda item. Um, please be respectful and then everybody, I know you will, will utilize the comics commonly accepted rules of courtesy, decorum, dignity, and good taste. So thank you very much for uh, being patient and adjusting with us. So, Ms. Spiegel, City Administrator, any update tonight? Nothing this evening, Your Honor. Very good. We have three public hearings, uh, one in community development and uh, two in public works. Our good friend, Alderwoman McGinnis, has uh, been gracious enough to help us with the community development tonight. Um, so, Alderwoman McGinnis, if you'd take this first public hearing. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I am opening the public hearing on the proposed conveyance of the heritage property located at 501 West 3rd Street to Foundation Housing. Um, and this is in Ward 3. Is there anyone from the public with comment? Come forward, please, and state your name. Good evening. My name is Richard Pecora. I am the pastor at All Saints Lutheran Church in Davenport. And I serve on the board of the uh, Ecumenical Housing Development Group. Earlier this year, the city of Davenport requested offers to purchase both the Heritage, a 120 unit I rise for low income adults, as well as a group of single family homes, duplexes, and six pluses, totaling 42 scattered site living units. The Ecumenical Housing Development Group submitted a $4.4 million offer for the heritage plus an offer for the appraised value of the scattered site housing. We agreed to maintain the scattered site property, serving low-income families and individuals, and to renovate the heritage. Subsequently, the city reported Ecumenical was not a finalist for the purchase. This was a surprise and disappointment to us. Uh, EHD priced its proposed purchase of the housing understanding the cash flow from the heritage would help support maintenance and management of the scattered site units. The city de designated at least $75,000 a year from what we could see from the heritage cash flow to support those scattered site housing. Without the heritage and scattered site together, sufficient funds to underwrite scattered site housing wouldn't be there. As background, we are, of course, the Ecumenical Housing Development Group. We have 167 units of housing, some near 6th and Marquette, and we own what's known as Fairmont Pines out on this road uh, north of Kimberly. For more than a dozen years, we've successfully partnered with Newberry Living of Des Moines to maintain and manage our property. Uh, they uh, have more than 50 apartment communities throughout Iowa and South Dakota and their expertise lies in managing, refinancing, renovating, and repositioning affordable housing communities. Right now they have 3,000 apartment homes. Newberry has an outstanding reputation with both the state of Iowa and the federal housing and urban development departments for their housing development and management. We first met, partnered with them uh, for an elderly housing project in. Bettendorf more than 10 years ago, and we went with and worked with them uh, on the Fairmont Pines uh, project as well. And of, you've heard of them with 501 Brady Street, the Bridges Lofts in Bettendorf, and the school board building off Locust. Uh, they are right now uh, working with Dan Dolan, as I understand it, to construct a multi million dollar apartment building on the site of the former Wonder Bread building. They are a known and trusted quantity in our community. Together, EHD, G, and Newberry jointly propose to meet with city representatives and other interested local housing organizations to create 
a financially sustainable long-term plan for the city's low-income housing. That has not happened. But we continue to make that offer. We believe a financially sustainable long-term plan for city low-income housing must focus on a solution that gives the highest priority to families and individuals and neighborhoods. People, not the price of the heritage building requires primary emphasis. The sale of affordable housing ought to be recognized as both a consequential issue and a conscionable issue. The city can back away from this housing, but the housing is still there. The impact of this issue will affect Davenport residents and neighborhoods for years to come. The new owners of the scattered site properties need adequate financial sources of revenue to support management and maintenance costs. If those sources are not available or maintained, the property will fall into disrepair, it'll affect tenant lives, it'll diminish affordable housing quality and availability, and, and erode neighborhood property values and certainly lead to the possibility of increased crime. Local not-for-profit or income housing organizations invest whatever revenue received back into their housing, as we have done. Selling this heritage to an out-of-state organization suggests the rental income from local housing will be reinvested elsewhere rather than here meeting local needs. When EHD acquired the former Horizon Homes, now called Fairmont Pines, the property was in disrepair and plagued by crime. I came before this city council about that, uh, about that situation, and they suggested we tear the buildings down, the housing down. Instead, we applied for and received $10 million in state funding to renovate and upgrade the property. Additionally, when we realized that the duplexes on West 42nd Street were part of the problem, we went and bought those duplexes and purchased them from their for-profit owners who did not have funds to maintain and manage the property adequately. Today, drive out onto Elsie and drive on West 42nd Street and you can immediately see the difference between our duplexes and those still privately owned. The evidence is there. Sources of fu funds to support local not-for-prousing housing remains scarce. City funds, local charitable foundations, casino grants, and state money cannot be expected to make up the difference in funds taken from the community through sale to out-of-state housing or for-profit buyers of the heritage and the scattered site housing. We have a specific proposal that we want to suggest to you this evening. We request that the city of Davenport pause the sale of the heritage and enter into negotiations with local not-for-profit affordable housing organizations to acquire both the heritage and the 42 scattered site units as part of a long-term sustainable affordable rental housing plan for the city. Let's sit down at the table and work it out. I've had people tell me, well, you're, this, the, the viability of this housing will be guaranteed by uh, uh, HUD rules. I don't believe that for a minute, and you know that too. All you gotta do is look around our country at the problems that there have been with affordable housing and seeing the problems there, and the HUD rules didn't save it. The only thing that's gonna save and maintain the quality of our affordable housing in this community is a long range plan that provides for sustaining that housing. And that's my comments for this evening. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak? Had some, an email? Yes, thank you, Alderwoman McGinnis. I have one that concerning this issue for the public hearing that I'll read in. So dated today, I'm sorry, October 20th, 2020, public hearing. So uh, it's addressed to the mayor and city council. Uh, my name is Jim Richardson, president of the Ecumenical Housing Development Group. Uh, Ecumenical Housing Development Group was incorporated in July 1994 as a non-for-profit corporation. 
Uh, its mission is to provide low-income families and individuals with safe, secure, permanent, affordable rental housing solutions. We currently own or have an interest in 167 units of affordable housing in the city of Davenport, primarily located in the central city area of Six and Ash and the area of Fairmount north of Kimberly Road. The sale of the heritage to an out-of-state non-for-profit puts the 42 scattered sites owned by the city at risk. Historically, cash flow from the heritage has been used by the city to supplement the scattered site rental income to support management and maintenance of the 42 units. The city also intends to sell the 42 scattered site units and ecumenical housing development group remains an interested party in those units. However, without the support of the income from the heritage, the value of the 42 units is, dismin is dismin diminished. New owners of the scattered site properties will need to seek other sources of revenue to support their management and maintenance. If outside sources of revenue are not available or attained, the properties may fall in disrepair, further diminishing their value. This leads to tenant dissatisfaction and hence greater turnover of tenancy, leading to more expenses to prep the unit for a reoccupancy. Declining property valuations lead to neighborhood decline and less tax revenue for the city. I urge the City Council to consider the long-term effects of the sale of the heritage separate from the 42 scattered sites. Do not be blindsided by the high valuation achieved by the heritage. The City needs to please consider the impact of the sale on neighborhood stabilization and the well-being and goodwill of the great citizens of the City of Davenport. If the Council chooses to proceed with separate sales of the heritage and the scattered sites, a portion of proceeds from the heritage should be dedicated to furthering the interest of preserving and producing affordable housing in the city of Davenport. Thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Jim Richardson, president of the Ecumenical Housing Development Group. And uh, that address is a PO box from Bettendorf, Iowa. Thank you. Thank you Anybody else from the public that would like to comment and the, uh, during this public hearing? Seeing no one, I move to close this hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, Alderwoman McGinnis, um, for filling in. Next to uh, Public Works, uh, there are two hearings. Alderman Dunn will lead those hearings. Alderman Dunn. Thank you, Your Honor. We've got two public hearings this evening for Public Works. I open the first public hearing on the plan, specification, form of contract, and estimated cost for the Public Works lobby remodel. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this public hearing? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. And that public hearing is closed. I open the second public hearing on the plan specification form of contract and estimated cost for the Blackhawk Creek Stabilization Project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this public hearing? Seeing none, I move to close the public hearing. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. And this public hearing is closed and back to you, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman Dunn. Um, that's all for public hearings. So the next item is petitions communications. I have one um, just uh, recently. Uh, the city went through a early uh, bond sale and uh, Mallory Miller and her team in finance, uh, Linda Foland and Bashar Garlash, and of course our city administrator, Ms. Corey Spiegel, uh, led that effort uh, with PFM. And uh, I thank my colleagues, uh, Alderman Condon and Alderman um, Grip for attending uh, the kind of the discussion with them to provide all the information we can uh, so that they can understand our situation, especially during COVID-19. So I'm happy to report that both agencies, SNP uh, and Moody's, gave us an outstanding um, comments and outlook for our financial situation. So I know Ms. Merritt's going to comment. I'll just add a few things and hopefully don't steal what she's going to say. But a um, couple things that drew attention to me. The ratings demonstrate this, and these are comments from them. Uh, the ratings demonstrate that the city's bonds are judged to be of high quality and remain a very low credit risk uh, for investors. The city continues to outperform its budget due to conservative budgeted practices supported by prudent policies. Uh, the city's ability to successfully maintain very strong finances as well as compliance with reserve and liquidity policies. 
uh, very strong budgetary flexibility. The rating agency highlights the city's strengths as strong management, strong budgetary performance, very strong liquidity, strong institutional framework, and an adequate economy to support financial needs. Um, they emphasize the large and stable tax base of the city, strong operating revenues and liquidity relative to its adopted budget, and complemented the city's financial operations that are strong and have resulted in steadily improving reserves over the last few years. A um, couple others, the city well, city's well-managed finances have resulted in steady improvements in the operating performance relative to the budget. The rating and stable outlook reflect Davenport's successful maintaining of very strong finances and compliance with its reserve and liquidity policy. So I just want to thank and credit our wonderful staff, our city administrator, our finance um, director, and her staff, and everybody that contributed to this during a time of COVID where many organizations, many cities, many governments are struggling with their financial situation or discussing how they're going to maybe uh, lay folks off or cut services or cut projects or do other things. We have two agencies here that said Davenport's going strong and their finances are, are good and, and they maintained our, our wonderful outstanding ratings. So um, I applaud the work and uh, Ms. Mallory Merritt, our uh, finance director, if you're on the phone, if you have anything else to or comment, I'd, I'd love to hear it. And then of course, Ms. Spiegel. I'll give you another second. Ms. Spiegel, do you want to say anything and while she's? Yeah. Yep, okay. So we'll just leave that alone for now. Okay. And, uh, and the next comment I see is Alderwoman McGinnis. I just wanted to take some uh, a couple personal things tonight, really. I want to thank everybody for their um, good wishes during my little uh, visit with Mr. COVID. Um, um, I'm doing much better. Um, I was very fortunate, and I am, and I understand that, and I know that isn't the case for many people. So, and um, thanks, uh, thank the city for uh, their strength and protocols here. Um, but again, I appreciate everybody's um, good wishes, and people were very kind. Um, I did uh, also want to um, uh, uh, organization that I'm deeply involved with in my neighborhood. We lost a structure this morning. Uh, it's a very sad event, but. I want to thank the city, the fire department, public works. Um, we worked with them this morning to quick, try to quickly make that safe, and they were working very hard. Um, it's always tough when you lose. This is the second large structure in our neighborhood that we've lost a fire in two years, and that's distressing. But um, really, thank, thanks so much to the staff, for, for to the fire department, and um, also public works today for everything they did. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, so I'll pause. I'm looking. I don't see anybody else. Uh, I apologize. Alderman Dunn. Thank you, Your Honor. I just want to take an opportunity to thank staff and the contractor because Division Street is back open, and they did a fantastic job. You know, I thought that was one of them projects that was going to be quite challenging, but I tell you what, it turned out very good, and I had very few complaints, so I just want to say thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Mayor? Uh, Mayor? Mayor? Alderman Lee. Mayor? I, I hear you, Alderwoman Lee. Uh, I see, I can't see you very well. I'm sorry. Uh, you're far away. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, Alderwoman McGinnis for um, stepping in for um, the hearings, and I will be backing you up. Uh, and it's good to see you again. I'm glad that you came through this fine. Uh, but I do want to say about COVID, this is very serious. We have huge spikes in the Quad Cities and in Iowa. Um, John Hopkins says we're at 21% for positivity, and the schools were supposed to be um, pulled back at 15%, and 5% is what's considered um, a semi-controlled uh, semi -control level. So we're way, way above that. I'd really like to recommend that everyone Please take care, follow the protocols, and that includes putting your mask over your nose and mouth um, whenever you're inside to protect everyone, including yourself. Um, and I really appreciate the city putting in uh, stronger, more strict protocols, um, but I still feel comfortable calling in rather than coming in. 
So anyway, I just wanted to remind people the numbers are high, getting higher, the hospitals are uh, getting full, and we want everyone to stay as, as safe and healthy as we can. So thank you again for everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Woman Lee. Anyone else? I'm pausing to just make sure. Very good, okay. We'll move to action items of discussion. The first area for discussion is community development. Alderwoman McGinnis will lead that discussion. Alderwoman Lee will set the agenda. Alderwoman McGinnis. Uh, we have one item on community, sorry. We have one item on community development tonight, and that is a resolution approving the proposed conveyance of the heritage property located at 501 West Third Street to Foundation Housing. Um, before we um, ask for public comment, I'm going to ask um, if we could have from staff a report on how this process went through. It was, a, it was a rather lengthy one, and I think it might be a good thing for us to review tonight. Yeah, thanks, uh, Bruce Berger, Community and Economic Development. Um, it was, it was a process that started um, even back in 2019 with some early discussions with HUD. So I do have a few slides just to kind of uh, maybe walk us through some of that and give you a little bit of an update on what, what got us to here tonight. Um, so um, primarily HUD recommended that as a small PHA, public housing authority, um, and they define that a very small one at under 50 units, which is what we have with our scattered sites, that um, we, we consider some repositioning options. So that's what we started talking about them with them back in 2019. It's just very difficult for those small PHAs to be able to stay financially viable. And they, they sense that, they've seen our reports, they were trying to find some ways that we could, um, we, we, that we might, some options for us. So that led us to start talking, and, and as I think you've all, um, we've mentioned before too, being a, a landlord, being a residential rental owner and manager of properties is not a city core function for us. So, um, so that, that really, um, those two things kind of came together. We looked at really all of the scattered site and the heritage property, and I know tonight we're mainly talking about the heritage, um, but because they're related and because some of the comments were related to scattered sites, some of this, uh, some of the, we'll, we'll cover a little bit on scattered sites as well. Um, there are upcoming capital needs for all of those assets. So they're, they're each at about that 40 year mark, a little over for the heritage. Um, and then um, the, the one thing I'd just like to, and maybe here's a good time to pause too, the heritage is project based section eight and the scattered site units are, um, duplexes, single family houses, they are under public housing. They are completely separate regulatory structures. They have separate guidelines, a lot of different processes with them. Um, so when we talk about, um, sometimes people will refer to public housing, I get that it's, they, they see maybe all of them together, but in reality, they are very different. When we started out looking at uh, perhaps um, exploring the sale of the properties, um, we did look at the scattered site units as well as the heritage units because the thought was there might be that, I'll call that perfect buyer out there that might be able to do both well. But I think as, as we chatted with the council throughout this period, they really are different assets. They have different, uh, you know, managing 120 units um, in a high rise versus managing a single family house or, and or duplexes scattered around the city are fundamentally different. And in the end, as we found, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but in the end, as we found, it was just difficult to find that perfect buyer that would actually do both of those things well and have and make us a, a competitive offer on a, on a valuable asset too. So when we started looking at the sale in general, and now speaking a little bit more directly to the heritage, we knew we wanted to retain those units specifically for project-based Section 8. That is what they have been since the beginning. Um, it's a great program. Um, it works fairly well. It's like Section 8, but they're, they're uh, tied to a particular property. And that's what we have with 120 units um, over the last 40 years. We knew that the, the offer, the, the entity that would acquire the property should look to maintain what we're doing, but actually hopefully improve that, both in terms of management as well as um, have the financial capability to make significant improvements that are likely on the horizon. And then um, from a city standpoint, we know um, it's a valuable asset. It's something that we should expect 
uh, a competitive offer from. So we started uh, really in early 2020, hired affordable housing advisors. Uh, we've talked about that before. That's a group that nationally markets properties like uh, project-based Section 8 around the country. Um, COVID slowed down a little bit throughout this whole process, but by May we had uh, obtained uh, roughly a dozen letters of interest from, from entities around the country. Um, we invited, I believe, seven or eight of those to continue on. Um, and in July, we received the final and best offers from those folks. Um, and I'm just giving you the quick overview here in terms of what could happen. So took a few months to review those. Um, they're, they're, we're in front of you now looking at um, what staff would recommend as the, the best offer on the heritage. Um, if, you, if it moves forward, if you would accept the offer, um, we would anticipate this buyer to undergo probably a three to four month process to obtain uh, HUD approval, uh, secure financing and do all of those things. Once that's done, if it's done, then likely the transfer would occur sometime in late spring, early summer. So what did we look at when we got those offers in? Um, one of the, the, obviously the offer amount is, is a, a key factor with an asset that you know has some value. But in addition, we looked at their portfolio. And so we wanted to make sure that the entity that we sold to uh, had a track record and this was uh, something that they're very adept at performing. Their property management, their property condition scores, these are some things that um, are actually comparable. They're one of the things that we looked at to try to compare how, how are they performing compared to how we've been performing over recent years. And then lastly, we looked at uh, personal references. We did call uh, rental inspectors and police uh, staff in, in their uh, respective cities to see how well, you know, sometimes that's more anecdotal than anything, but it's a little bit of a reference check, so. Uh, from this, from that, that process, we ended up getting seven offers in, and they ranged from $4 million to $6.35 million. Um, so a, quite a bit of a range. Um, some of the common themes throughout those offers, uh, the entities uh, had, had small portfolios all the way up to large ones. Most had large, I will say. There were a few offers that were on the small side with several hundred, maybe two to 3,000 units in their portfolio. Many others had anywhere from 12,000 units all the way up to 100,000 units. Um, most had little interest in the scattered sites was a common theme. Um, the, the single family duplex properties, they, they really either didn't want or if, if, we, if they had to take them, they would take them as part of the deal, but that really wasn't their interest. They didn't have a plan for those um, for the most part, um, especially the top offers. Um, and then uh, what we ended up doing was saying, well, we have quite a range. Um, let's focus on our top three offers and dive deeper into those folks. So we did. Um, we checked through their portfolios and what we found again was really we couldn't go wrong with any of the three, but in the end, um, the nuances that stood out um, were those that actually had a defined affordable housing mission. That's the only thing that they worked on, um, that they had uh, a great reference from HUD. So we had um, HUD loving their property manager that they are proposing to use and that they proposed some rehab of the facility. and and. By facility, I would say both site, common areas, as well as interior parts of the units. So what we're recommending for you tonight to consider for next week would be selling to Foundation Housing. They were the top offer of 6.35 million. Uh, they've been in business around 30 years. They're out in Maryland. Uh, they own primarily um, of their 100 and some complexes they own, a third of them are senior disabled complexes, just like the Heritage, their project-based Section 8. Um, those complexes are scattered primarily Midwest and East Coast. They, they really don't have a, a big presence um, out West. They acquired their first property in Iowa. And so of the top three, they were the only one that had an Iowa uh, complex. And uh, that's called, I believe, Cedar River Towers. Um, this is a picture of it, um, 85 units, so it's, it's similar in size. And it, and it needed rehab. And so they acquired the property a few years ago and, and rehabbed it. Um, Selden Management is who they use, and they're one of the higher ranked uh, 
property management firms, and as I mentioned, they're they're respected by HUD in this area. We we talked with our regional HUD folks, and they they had nothing but good things to say about Selden. So, in terms of tenant impact, so this is something that constituents might ask about. Um, we've we've had meetings with tenants about this. Um, they they are staying in place. The new new buyer, if if we end up selling to them, will retain the same program. So that same project based section eight is the plan. That is what is uh, attractive about uh, these complexes across the country. Um, they plan to ask for a 20 year, um, a long term agreement. We have been doing five year agreements with HUD and renewing them every five. Um, as a condition of their investment in the property, they want to know that for 20 years at least, that they will have that long term affordability and continue the project based section eight program. Um, there would be no change in tenant rents. So uh, if a tenant, if, if $800 is the fair market rate for a tenant now and they can afford to pay 200, they'll continue to pay 200 for that unit. Um, that, is, that is the way HUD works. It is based on how much you can afford to pay um, rather than, than any other factors. And then they do plan rehab. What we understand is they would close on the property. They like to get their architects in and take a look and figure out um, what the repairs and, and improvements would be. And then they um, tend to work with uh, tenants so that they, d they minimize displacement for those tenants. So those, ideally they can fix up the vacant units and move people into those units within the building while they fix up the unit and then move the tenant back into their, their improved unit. So, oops, skip two. So um, our recommendation would be to uh, sell to foundation housing. They are a nonprofit um, and uh, they would then proceed with that anticipate three to four month process with HUD and in the meantime staff would begin on coordinating our transition planning. Um, the only thing I can say just kind of in closing too unless you have any other questions for me and I know you know you still have more time to discuss the some of the comments made re related to the splitting of the assets um, maybe something worth addressing. Um, in terms of uh, the scattered site units, which are really not in front of you here tonight, but the, the main reason for separating the assets, apart from there not being a really great, perfect buyer that can do a great job with both classes of assets. The other reason we would say that the scattered site doesn't perform well is related to the public housing program that it's tied to. And so as we've talked through this with folks, including EHDG, which both Jim Richardson and Richard Procor are part of, those single family and duplex properties would not need to remain public housing to remain affordable housing. And in fact, if you disentangle from public housing but retain as, as affordable, you actually get rid of a lot of reporting requirements, a lot of inspection requirements, and all the rent and everything else that goes along with the tie-in to HUD. They can still be affordable. HDG's properties, those duplexes that they referred to, they've done a great job. They have a great reputation with it and they're able to stay afloat with it. Similarly, our thought would be it would be great to work with them and other nonprofits locally with those scattered site units. So we are soliciting offers on those properties. Or, I'm sorry, we're soliciting letters of interest on those properties. And, um, and actually we have until the end of October for local nonprofits to do that. We're talking with tenants as well to see if any might become home buyers of their units. And then because it's a completely different program, there's a whole process. We'll, we will need to come back forward to city council to talk through what we plan to do with those scattered site units, apply to HUD and move forward from there. It's a little bit longer process, a little bit more involved, but it is completely separate from, would have had to have been separate anyway. So. So anyway, those are my comments just real quick. If you have any, anything else for me, I'll, I'll be right here. Thank you. We, we may want need to talk to you again. First of all, though, is there anyone with public uh, with comment? In the public with comment? Anybody uh, from the council? Okay. Uh, Alderman Ann, first, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, you know, this is a long time coming, and I think Staff has done a great job in putting a package together that might possibly be a win-win, win for the city, win for the tenants. You know, we're fortunate to close the deal and have it move forward. So congratulations, good job. Anybody else? 
Any of our colleagues that are on the phone? I'm sorry. Oh, um, Alderman Mary? Lee. Yes, yes, Alderman Lee. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, um, Alderman McGinnis. As I've been saying over time, as the city's been considering this, I have over half the properties, and not over, almost half the properties and half the units in the 8th Ward. Uh, I've met with all the tenants. Uh, I've got a great concern making sure that, um, that the city do the very best they can to keep their word about uh, they wouldn't have to move or unless they chose to and the rents would not go up um, based on what the city said in January. Um, I understand that the heritage and the scattered sites are different in terms of the regulations that they have to follow. Um, I just want to make it clear that I am very interested in having these, all of them, be covered under by a nonprofit. I would appreciate it being local nonprofit. You know, I do understand that this company recently, that the company for Heritage recently bought a property in Waterloo, but we don't, they recently did it, so we don't have a record for their activities in Iowa. Um, and I understand that affordable and public housing are different, but I do want to do the right thing. It's not about profit. Um, it's about people, as particularly as it relates to the um, scattered sites. I have a 12-plex in my ward. There are people that are very stressed who are living in these uh, scattered housing, at least in my ward, because you know, they, they don't know what's happening with their lives, and they have, for decades, some of them have been living there, including um, handicapped. So, and they've created communities with each other uh, to support each other, which is really important, particularly um, if your income is lower. You really need to learn to depend on your neighbors, and that's one of the most impressive things I found as I talked to the folks in my ward. I'd like to encourage the city to make sure that um, separating the heritage is the most um, um, reasonable thing to do and most feasible thing to do if you have to. Um, it would be wonderful if they could all be together because it would be helpful, I think, for the scattered sites, particularly, as you said, Director Berger, that a lot of the, um, the places are reaching their 40-year limit and it's going to be very costly, whoever gets them including if a tenant buys one. They're gonna have a lot of things that will need to be replaced quickly. And having gone through that this year myself with my own home, it can be very expensive in a hurry. So I just want to encourage the city to do the right thing, uh, make sure that we're making the best step forward that we can. I, I believe that you're taking good care of the people in the heritage, but I also wanna make sure you're taking equal care of the people in the scattered sites. And yes, I understand that a Section 8 can, you know, they can go anywhere they want, but the question is, do they want to? Or are they feeling forced to? And this is also not a great time between COVID and um, our serious re uh, recession that we're in due to COVID. It's not a great time to go out looking for places to live. So uh, I'm very concerned about that as well. So that's my take. I believe that the heritage and the, um, even if they're sold separately, I do believe that the uh, issue is interrelated. So I wanted to make that clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alderman Lee. Um, Alderman Grip. Thank you, Alderwoman McGinnis. Uh, first off, I wanted to start by uh, thanking Director Berger and his team. I think you guys have done a, a really nice job uh, of working this and you've taken into consideration uh, the input and direction you've gotten from the council. Uh, when you first uh, brought this to us, uh, some of the things that I advocated for was ensuring that we were either maintaining uh, or even increasing affordable housing in Davenport by going through this process, uh, that we were taking into consideration um, the residents and not displacing them. And then um, with the scattered sites, working with our local nonprofits uh, to ensure that they were taken over um, by local nonprofits if possible um, to help in what uh, Alderwoman Lee talked about, which is 
ensuring the quality of life of the residents of these uh, scattered sites uh, that we own. And I think that uh, you've done that. Obviously, I understand um, that this is a, uh, a good uh, financial move for the city of Davenport. It gets us out of the, the landlord business. It uh, takes back some of our uh, capital improvement budget for a lot of long-term uh, maintenance costs that we're on the hook for. And I think that um, is the right thing to do from a financial standpoint. But uh, what I've heard from my colleagues and myself and the direction that uh, the staff has been going is this decision can't be made only on finances. We have to be uh, considering the folks who utilize these um, affordable housing units. And I think what you have brought to us um, does just that. And then I did want to uh, just recognize Pastor Pecora and, and Jim Richardson and Econo Economical Housing uh, because they are great uh, community partners and I do appreciate them uh, speaking up and being engaged. Um, uh, but in the end, I, I do uh, agree with the staff's recommendation and I'll be supporting it and I hope and I know that ecumenical housing will be there uh, in the discussion for the scattered sites. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, uh, Mayor Madison. Uh, thank you, Alderman McGinnis. And just just so everybody uh, understands the thought process for me, if this goes through uh, and the sale goes through for over six million um, in consultation with a few folks, I, I'm considering putting together a. Uh, a little committee of all their folks and maybe some city folks to discuss uh, where the six million should go uh, back into housing. Uh, we think we all think that's important, and maybe some other programs. So uh, just so you know, I'm thinking of, of doing that if this goes through. So um, I think it's important that this money stays in 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 housing. So thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And I just want to thank the staff for um, the thorough report. Um, I, I had a couple questions, if, if, uh, if I could, Director Berger. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about property condition scores. It didn't sound like we were the A student here. Um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about, you know, our experience as a city and part of that, you know, experience and what we do every day and, um, and the, or the firm that we're looking at for Heritage? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Bruce Berger, Community and Economic Development again. The... So one of the things that um, is required by HUD is what they call REAC scores. Um, and there are scores that generally you, you take between a year. Is it better? Oh, you need it louder. So it's, it, those are scores that um, you generally get every year, every other year. And they're sort of surprise visits. Um, they've become a fairly good barometer of how well um, a facility is being maintained. But it also goes even beyond just the physical maintenance and bleeds a little bit into um, the policies and procedures that are in place to help protect tenants and, and all those things. Um, as a result, um, I, we, our scores have been declining somewhat. And so, yeah, to your point, I think we've, we've fallen into probably the C category, if you will, um, on the grade sheet. And um, really, all of the top three performers that we looked at that were um, in the top tier um, have amazing REAC scores. So at a minimum, I mean, that's sort of where staff was at, that we're, even if they weren't planning any reinvestment in the properties, we would be doing our residents a, a service. But on top of it, they're planning further improvements to the properties. So we would anticipate sometimes those improvements may take, those REAC scores may take a little bit of time to come up, but they, in, in general, once they get some of their rehab done, I, we would definitely like to see uh, um, probably a better outcome than what we have right now. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Anyone else on council? Um, Alderman Lee, if you would set the agenda, please. Alderman Lee. I don't see her on, but I can set the agenda. Good I enough. make a recommendation that we keep this on the discussion. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Kyle. I'm sorry. I, I was a little slow on the button. That's a, you disappeared off my screen is the only reason I jumped in. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. 
Um, yes, this is Alderwoman Lee, and I uh, move to put item one on the discussion agenda for next week. Second. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's on the discussion agenda. Thank you very much. That's all, Your Honor? Yes, thank you. We're just, we're enjoying ourselves, so that's good. Um, our next area of discussion is public safety. Alderman Ambrose and Alderman Job Jim will lead that discussion. And Alderman Ambrose, I see sometimes it happens to me a lot because my ears fall down. So I see your mask slip down. So if you could put that on, I'd appreciate it. And then lead the discussion. Thank you. All right. First item on the discussion is a second consideration ordinance amending schedule one of chapter 10.96 entitled snow routes by adding and deleting various streets. Anybody from public council? The second is a second consideration ordinance amending schedule five of chapter 10.96 entitled four way stop intersections by deleting West 6th Street at Vine. Anybody from the public council? The next one is liquor license, and we don't go through those, but you can see them on the public platform. And I would ask Alderman Joe Jim to set the agenda. I make a motion all items be placed on consent agenda. All in favor? Second. Opposed? Aye. 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 Thank you, Your Honor. Next item is public works. Uh, Alderman Dunn and Alderman Dorman will lead that discussion. Alderman Dorman. Thank you, Your Honor. We have five items on the public works agenda this evening. First item is the third consideration of an ordinance amending chapter 13.34.060 entitled requirements for stormwater management plans defining the documentation required prior, prior to concessional permit issuance. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council. Seeing none, this item will move on. Item number two is a resolution accepting construction work for the FY20 Civic Access ADA ramp program project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council. Hearing none, this item will move on. Item number three is a resolution accepting work completed under phase one of the downtown decorative street light replacement project, hollow plane lights project. The total contract with Davenport Electric Contracting was $131,191.50. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Please step forward. Bill Handel, 4th uh, Warwick Alderman Handel. Also Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm assuming these are all the brand new uh, street lights that have been added uh, fairly recently. I see many places in town where there are a number of these uh, replica early 20th century lights with uh, high efficiency uh, bulbs in them. And they're also very low and they're spaced very closely. I don't know if what lighting engineer was used on those, but they, although they may create some increased, you know, if you put a foot candle meter underneath them, you've got higher foot candle. What they do, because they're very short height, if you've noticed them, it's a tremendous amount of glare that they create. Um, and I don't know uh, to what extent that had been considered when these things were put up. And I, and I don't know if this is phase one, I don't know how many more phases we have to go, but I think somebody ought to, before we spend any more money in the city, look at possibly getting the same amount of, of actual light out of them uh, by having fewer fixtures taller fixtures so that they're not blinding people when they're driving their cars down the street, which they certainly are. I was looking at the ones on the uh, Lafayette Square apartments, and they're right against the, the, uh, those apartment buildings, uh, the second floor units. I can't imagine having an apartment with, uh, with such a bright light shining into my apartment. And uh, what, the, what it's called is glare. And, if you look at the light fixtures that Bettendorf has just put down in, with their I-74 project, very nice light, the 21st century light fixtures. You don't get the glare, They've, they're controlling that light. 
Um, essentially, we're, we're going backwards to the type of lighting that was put in before anybody had lighting engineers in the early 20th century, and I don't understand it. That's all I'd like to say about that, but uh, please consider that for future lighting on, on the upcoming phases. Thank you. Anyone else? Any council? Seeing none, this item will move on. Item number four is a resolution approving the plan specification form a contract and estimated cost for the Public Works Library and Public Works Lobby Improvement Project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing none. Alderman Ambrose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have a, a picture with this? might possibly look like when it's completed for the public. Right here, public work. Um, Brian's bringing a photo up, um, and I can help answer any questions should you have any. Get another picture. Hold it. Mayor Matson. So thanks. So if you tell us, where's the front door? So the front door is basically, imagine if you're walking directly so into the lobby now. As if, and then it's, yes. So basically we're inverting where the counters are um, and, and pulling them more that way to create um, more space for staff and um, for an area for the public. So we'd walk in in the... So if you're walking in and, and you're looking directly straight in this where the gentleman with the purple shirt, yeah. um, if you turn right, that's where you go to Nicole's office and a staff. And if you turn left, that's where you typically go to engineering. Thank you. Is this project to pr protect the employees from the COVID virus? Um, both the employees and the residents and uh, people who come in to get permits. Thank you, Clay. Any, anyone else? Seeing and hearing none, this item will move on. Item number five is a resolution approving the plan specification form a contract and estimated cost for the Blackhawk Creek stabilization project. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Council? Seeing none, I'd just like to say this project's been in the works a long time and I'm glad to see it moving forward. So thanks, staff. Uh, with that, Alderman Dorman, would you set the agenda, please? I move to place all items on the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. And that concludes public works for this evening, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman Dunn. The last area to discuss tonight is finance. Alderman Condon and Alderman Peacock will lead that as discussion. Alderman Condon. Condon, please. Thank you, Your Honor. We have eight, uh, seven items on the agenda this evening. The first item is a second consideration ordinance amending chapter 2.82 entitled management of public records. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? Seeing none, that'll move on. The second item on the agenda is a first consideration ordinance providing for the sale and issuance of not to exceed $50 million, general $50 million general obligation corporate bonds series 2020B and for the levy of taxes to pay the same. Um, there's gonna be a staff recommendation to suspend the rules and the passage of second and third considerations on this item. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? And before I uh, ask if anyone from council would like to uh, speak, I'll invite uh, Ms. Merritt up to the podium. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and Mallory Merritt, CFO. Uh, as the mayor mentioned earlier, uh, both rating agencies did reaffirm our ratings uh, earlier this week. Uh, our, our bond rating as we head into a bond sale is very important really for two reasons. Uh, one, it conveys our credit worthiness to potential investors. Uh, and then secondly, it's one of the considerations in determining what interest rate that we will receive. And it's very important uh, to us as staff that we're ensuring that uh, we get the lowest cost of borrowing, both for you as our elected body and for our citizens that we serve. Uh, as always, I wanted just to offer a special uh, appreciation to 
to you as our elected body in ensuring that we do have prudent policies. That was one of the things that was repeatedly called out in the reports. Uh, and then also to our city administrator, uh, the work of my predecessor, and also to our management team for ensuring that our budget is well managed. That was also another area that that was uh, called out again and also our uh, budgetary flexibility that we have, which has really allowed us to be successful uh, and mitigate the impacts of COVID. So again, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for that. And then just a couple of procedural things uh, because this is kind of a unique item. Uh, our bond sale is scheduled for next Wednesday. Uh, so that morning we will uh, work with our financial advisor to send out a notification to the market that we have roughly 25 million uh, in bonds for sale. Uh, we will receive bids on that. Once we receive them, we will work to evaluate the true interest cost. Uh, our bond council, all in the same day, will prepare a substitute ordinance that we will bring forward to you uh, that evening. So there will be there will be a request for you to substitute that item uh, with the new one, with the actual terms of the transaction. And then uh, the request to waive uh, the second and third readings and pass on first consideration is so that we can actually close the transaction. So I know that one can be a little bit of a complicated item, so I just wanted to explain that, but it is a well-defined process and we've gotten good results in the past. Thank you for that summary. Uh, I'll now open it up to council, Alderman Grip. Uh, thank you, Alderman Condon. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Mayor Matson said earlier and uh, give credit where credit's due to our staff um, and, and previous councils. Uh, had the opportunity to uh, sit in on the, uh, the, the bond rating uh, review process for the first time, and our staff was well prepared, overly prepared. We got into the meeting and you would expect a, a lot of questions and the questions had already been answered. And really it, it seemed like uh, th there was disbelief with uh, how solid of a position we were in compared to other municipalities. Um, and that, that goes back to having the processes in place, right? People change, uh, but you have to have uh, solid financial practices in place. We have that. There's been a, a commitment from uh, previous councils in this council, and hopefully there will continue to be that commitment. Uh, but we also have a, a very dedicated and strong uh, administration team who's doing a great job, uh, which is why we're in uh, the position and have the ability to uh, react positively to uh, the COVID virus and the pandemic. So uh, thank you uh, to our staff for, for all that you've done to get us into this position. And, and to my council colleagues as well. Thank you, Alderman Grip. Alderwoman Lee. Thank you. I want to reinforce what Alderman and Kyle uh, Grip just said all the way through. And I also, normally I do not support suspension of the rules, but in this one it's very important, so I will vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else, uh, that item will move on. That item will remain on discussion. Item number three is a resolution setting a public hearing for November 4th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. in the council chambers for the purpose of amending the North Urban Renewal Plan, wards two, six, seven, and eight. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? That item will move on. Item number four is a resolution awarding a contract to create a new park and install playground equipment at the site of the Jersey Farms Park to Emory Construction Group of Moline, Illinois for the amount of $439,799, CIP 64074 in Ward 8. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? That item will move on. Item number five is a resolution accepting the donation of Gabe's all-inclusive play village at Vanderveer Park. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, I just want to say thanks to the staff again and 
all the folks and Maria and her team at, from Gabe's Playground and, and the work that they did to keep this alive and keep it going and keep it on the on the radar for us to make sure that our staff and everyone puts this together uh, many years coming and I appreciate the perseverance and, and work um, that everyone did to, to continue to make Davenport a great city and have now two outstanding areas uh, in our city for all children. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll just add that that uh, that effort was well on its way as I came onto council. And uh, so while I don't feel I can accept any credit for it, I, I can promise you that it's gonna be well used. I already have three really big fans of the playground down there and uh, everyone involved did a great job. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Older woman Dickman. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you have also brought your small children there and they have also loved it every inch of it. Um, I came on council when I think that this was, we thought that it would be happening faster as all things in government. Um, we initially anticipate that they might be able to happen faster. Um, so, you know, again, also just kind of want to echo the comments of thank you for the, the perseverance of the people who got this done. Um, and just if you have children, especially, and you haven't gone and checked it out, you should absolutely go check it out. Um, my girls loved it. Every other parent I know, their kids have loved it. Um, and it's the really, uh, I think it really speaks to Davenport and how cool we all are. So, thank you. Don't believe I see anyone else from council, so we'll move that item along. Uh, item number six is a resolution approving the Guardian of Life Insurance Company of America to be the carrier of the city of Davenport's employee basic life, long-term disability, accidental death, and dismemberment, and voluntary life insurance coverages. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? That item will move on. Item number seven is a motion approving the purchase of an alerting system for all fire stations from Tri-City Electric of Davenport, Iowa, in the amount of $64,785. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address this item? Anyone from council? Um, that's the last item on the agenda. We, below, uh, we have purchases from 10,000 to 50,000. We don't read each of those out loud, but they're listed here for your uh, review. Alderman Peacock, will you please set the agenda? I move that item one, three through seven, be placed on the consent agenda and number two be left on the discussion agenda. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That concludes finance, Your Honor. Thank you, Alderman Condon. Um, next we have uh, ordinance, other ordinances, resolutions, and motions. I don't think we have any. Very good. And now um, we'll have public as business. Is there any public that would like to talk? Please come to the podium, name, ward, or address. If you're not from here, we'd love to know where you're from, and you have five minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Bill Handel, uh, Ward 4, also in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, as you know, I live in Nashville, and I'm up here quite a bit of the time. Most of the time, Joe Helen uh, uh, holds down the fort in Nashville, and I'm gone this time. We uh, decided to take uh, our little cat, Gracie, with us, and we came through St. Louis. Joe Helen had never seen the arch, and we figured that was a good time. So we, uh, if you haven't been there recently, uh, the city of St. Louis has uh, finished, maybe last year, nearly $500 million project to enhance their uh, park at, uh, at the Gateway Arch, uh, adding, uh, covering over one block of the freeway that separated their downtown from the river and the park, and, uh, and rebuilding and enhancing their, uh, their museum at, uh, it's now at the, uh, I guess the west side, the city side of, of the arch. Um, and it get, it really gets you thinking what cities will go to, to, uh, enhance the connection between their downtowns and, uh, and their river, um, or their water. Boston, about 25 years ago, spent 25 billion with a B dollars to demolish an elevated freeway that separated their downtown 
from uh, their bay. And now, of course, and uh, Seattle had spent, I don't know, at least a billion taking down an elevated uh, freeway near their downtown. Uh, I don't think Davenport has really ever, uh, I may be wrong, thought of what River Drive does to separate our downtown from its river. And I really think uh, we need to spend the time and the money to look at alternatives to the situation we have right now with interstate, I mean, uh, US 61 and 67, dividing our our downtown from the river. And obviously there's nothing we can do about the train tracks, but uh, perhaps something can be done about that. Um, I was at the, uh, um, the levy commission meeting, uh, improvement commission meeting last month and uh, was very heartened to find that the nationally, internationally known firm of Sasaki has been brought on with uh, Mark Green for our uh, flood control project. And uh, I think if we did anything, it, uh, we would want to uh, engage on them to uh, maybe review and uh, enhance the levy plan that uh, RDG came up with two years ago. Uh, but uh, I was told I was, that item was brought up at the meeting last month and uh, the word that I got from uh, the chair of the Improvement Commission was that no, uh, the city was not interested in revisiting that even with the expertise Sasaki would bring to the city and to the project. So I uh, certainly would urge the city to uh, take the time and perhaps the money is already in there with the flood control project to uh, look to see what can be done to uh, uh, increase the connection between our downtown and our river um, and uh, perhaps uh, make alterations to River Drive that might uh, give us that, uh, that option. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, just pausing usually, but okay. Any other reports, Ms. Spiegel? There is not. Is there a motion to adjourn? There is a motion. And there's a second. All in favor to adjourn. Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Have a good evening. Be safe. Wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands.